hey, we're going to talk about blockchain and a digital identity. So this is actually a really interesting real world problem that we're trying to solve with blockchain right now. And it actually has a lot of people working on it. So right now, what they're thinking is there are about a billion people in the world that don't have access to an identity. And what I mean by that is that they don't have an official identity. They may have a, a social security number or a national ID number. They just don't have a piece of paper that proves that that is their number. Um, there may be people out there that simply don't have a national identity number of any kind. They may not have an international identity like a passport. And we have all sorts of different kinds of identity as it goes along. So I've got my state sponsored. I've got my federal sponsored. So I've got my driver's license. I've got my passport. I've got a couple other identity things from, from, from schools that I teach at. So we all have different kinds of identity and Microsoft right now is actually working on creating uh, digital IDs and inside the blockchain to help empower people and refugees. So this is actually really an interesting thing. You may forget to grab your, your identity or you may lose your identity along the way, but most people have got a cell phone. So it's really interesting. It's sort of like America during the depression. Um, a lot of people had a phone, uh, had a car. Um, that cell phone has become that critical device that we have and almost everyone in the world has a cell phone or access to a cell phone so what makes this interesting is that that digital id and the way they're setting this up as an application um, would empower people as long as they have that cell phone to have an identity so this will help link them not only with the formal financial sector right but help you through um, being a refugee help you being um, if you get caught or in a, in a country, you don't know where you are. You probably have your cell phone or something else going on, right? That took you out of the mainstream. Um, it will actually help you um, link with the formal financial sector, helps link you up with government and services, and you can do all this through that Authenticator app as long as you have that cell phone. So the Authenticator doesn't just use a password, it uses an extra layer of protection, a code or token or identity to return a user or device. So this is a really interesting way for users to control their digital identity. Now. This is a big deal, right? In all honesty, there's been a lot of people really working on this. And again, it's not just Microsoft. It's a part of the whole ecosystem that's going on right now. Um, they're calling it a DID, a decentralized digital identity. And it's not just technology, right? There's actually real work going on in this. And it is really fascinating what that work actually looks like. So beyond the hype, right? When you finally really get down to it, decentralized identity is a trust framework which identifiers such as usernames can be replaced with IDs, a number of uh, 64 bit um, hex code, whatever, that are self-owned, independent. And then you can use this for data exchange. And that data exchange can be for money. That data exchange can be for food stamps, um, housing assistance, anything else that happens. And again, a lot of people have that cell phone. Right. And that becomes your basis. The only problem is if you lose the cell phone. But even if you lose the cell phone, there are other tokens that um, you have to have to make sure that you get it. And then there's a recovery mode that goes along with it as well. So you can protect your privacy and secure transactions, but enable some kind of data, data exchange with this. And it really makes it kind of interesting on how they're taking a look at it and how you can take that identity that you have and then use that to access services. So how Microsoft has actually embedded this is that they've used it as a foundational technical component to make, to make the centralized identity possible, right? So unlike centralized identity, which we have today, you know, email addresses, which is half of the problem if someone's gonna hack your username and password, well, the username's usually your, your, your email address. So if they've got that, they've got half the problem already. These digital IDs are generated, owned, and controlled by individuals, not companies or other centralized ident entities. Once that root identity is in the blockchain, that becomes yours as long as you don't lose it. The problem is, is when you lose it, and that's going to happen. There will be points where, where you're going to lose your, your digital ID. You know, you'll, you'll lose your phone or something else. And there are ways of recovering it. Um, right now, if you lose your, your, your crypto coin, wallet there's a 12 word passphrase again we're working on different kinds of solutions to make this thing happen so lots of different approaches to this but they all revolve around the same concept the user-owned unique identifier tied to your crypto keys right and routing endpoints so i'm going to have a public private key pair i'm going to have a, a base 64 number something that will show that i'm really who i am and that will absolutely be me 
right? And then it will be decentralized because it's in the blockchain. As long as it has passed through peer validation, um, I'm really kind of good to go. We can then turn around and use that identity to access services. As long as those services have been enabled in the blockchain, I can use those to go ahead and access other things. Um, through other what's called a validator node or a utility node mechanisms. It's a really, really, really challenging but fun thing to be working on right now. And again, the thing I like about it is that this one's actually got some legs underneath it. So it's available now. Um, you can actually go ahead and create your own. Um, there's a whole open ID self-issued auth authenticate with sites, apps, and services. And you can go to identity uh, identity.foundation and go and make it. Um, so the identity foundation is sort of like how I'm looking at the old GPG. Um, pretty good privacy and you can go do this it's really interesting how it works um, issuers such as company agencies identities can create digital IDs and issue verifiable credentials to users so that's interesting what happens if I don't request that digital ID and they still make me one again there are some flaws in this right there are some ways of going about and making sure that we are doing the right thing but we need to make sure that assertion of who I am happens and we want to make sure that we can move away from paper because if you got your social security card um, when I got mine which was about 30 years ago um, it's getting a little dog tooth right now and I didn't no one laminated it right so that piece of paper is just about dead <laughs> but you know if I had it as a digital ID that would be something different but then again if my social security number is out there right now uh, that's a problem so your ID matters who you are, your physical form of, identi of identification, are not widely available for every human for various reasons, whether that's financial, whether that's uh, geographical, um, whether that's war or anything else that can go along and disrupt life. Um, you may not have your physical ID card with you. It probably got lost or stolen or something else. If you are homeless, it is really hard to hold on to anything um, in a homeless situation. So your physical form of ID May, you may have had it, but it's no longer there. Approximately 1.1 billion people worldwide don't have any way to claim ownership over their identity. So at least one-seventh of the world's population basically in that vulnerable state, unable to vote, unable to own property, cannot open a bank account, cannot find employment, cannot get services from the state. And again, that not having an identity in this world that we live in is really a liability. It is really a huge liability. And then the inability to attain identification jeopardizes a person's access to the financial system. And in turn, if you can't get into the financial system for whatever reason, that limits everything that you can do down the way. If, if you have a, what China uses a social credit score, if you have a low social credit score, um, it's really hard to get services. In, in the West, if you don't have an identity, it's really hard to get into the banking system. And if you can't get into the banking system, you can't do anything in terms of capitalism. It's really hard. Or you end up working on, on the gray side of the house. You end up working with payday loan vendors. You end up working with um, um, green uh, people that are alternatives to banks. And those are really, really sketchy, right? And nothing against PayPal here, but they're a perfect example, right? You don't need to have a proof of identity for PayPal, but if they think there's something hinky going on with your account, they can freeze your account and take all your money. And without reason, without cause, um, and they will do it. If they think something weird is going on, um, they will literally seize your account. So you end up in these situations that may be untenable because you can't work in the formal financial system. And you end up outside of that system, you end up in the informal financial system, and that can be really costly. Um, I mean, really costly. Uh, not just from, from loss or theft, but a lot of other reasons why. Um, especially things like interest rates if you're doing loans otherwise the other thing too is that we have fragments of identity I've got like about a dozen different identities right I've got my formal full given name I've got my my short name I've got my nickname um, I've got titles so I have you know a doctor and and then a bunch of letters after my name so there's a lot of fragments of my identity so citizens with officially recognized forms of identification continue to lack complete ownership and control over the identity and it's because we have fragmented online identity right I have identity at the colleges I teach at I have identity with the state I have and my international identity with my passport I have a lot of things that say I am this person but none of them are unified. They're all separate pieces of paper or separate little cards in my wallet. So then there's companies holding on to the data. All my employers, um, all the people that I've contracted with, all the people that I have done 
lectures on and everything else. We all have little chunks of data, whether that's 1099 or W2, and again, that formal process. So it forces a lifetime of fraud mitigation, and that is a big thing, right? Um, once a social security number is issued and lost, there is little to no recourse, and that is a big, big, big deal. I mean, right now, and through no fault of my own, right, I've been involved in 57 different hacking events right now where my identity including my social has been completely compromised and right now i am on a lifetime fraud alert there's nothing i can do it's not because of anything i did, didn't do anything stupid but it's because of, of big companies that could not hold my data in a way that would protect them so why do we need to do this why do we need a digital id because it solves problems Right again, we're back to that and accessibility. Approximately the 1.1 billion people, no proof of identity, so they're among the poorest of the poor on the planet. If we can give them an identity and we can get them hooked into certified services, right? Whether that's food, whether that's clean water, whether that's a place to live in a yurt, whether that's whatever. Um, wow, talk about being able to really raise all boats. We've already done a great job in addressing poverty in a lot of ways the digital identity is the next step in this, making sure that they have an identity so they can interact with the formal systems that the planet has. We have a lot of cumbersome paperwork. Oh my good Lord, how many times do you have done W2 or 1099 or a W9 or an I9 or something else um, to prove who you are, that you're a citizen, that you've done this or that? You know, it would be great if I could just give you a QR code and say, dude, this is who I am. I'm really this person, so go for it. Right? And that would make life easy. I would just be like so much easier than the amount of paperwork you have to fill out, right? And then what happens if you fill out the paperwork wrong, right? That would be horrible. So if we can keep people inside a traditional identification system, we're pretty good to go. So without possessing a physical identity, you can't do school, jobs, passport, access many government services. So that inaccessibility has real world ramifications. So having an identity is crucial to gaining access to the existing financial system. Conversely, 60% of the 2.7 billion unbanked people already own mobile phones. So, hey, guess what? Blockchain mobile phone identity solutions, maybe even some blockchain banking solutions would work as long as we can keep them inside of the system to assist them in getting services and support. And again, some people will be like going, oh my God, no, they can't be part of the system. But yeah, no, if they do, um, the potential for good here is great. And I think a lot of people don't think about identity as being tied to services. Then there's data insecurity. All right, so most of our valuable information is on centralized government databases. So my databases with OPM, with the US Navy, um, with a bunch of others that have been hacked in the past, right? Um, it's all over the place. I've got identity with the state I live in. I've got identity at the states I work at. I have identity with the federal government in multiple different forms. So it's all over the place. Man, trying to, again, trying to root through a background check with me is, is a horrible process. I feel sorry for anyone that has to do that. And there's a lot of single points of failure. Um, I actually had one company I worked for. Uh, we just needed to verify my employment there. And they were busy. It took them almost 90 days to verify my employment, which really held back um, a really cool job offer and really pissed off a lot of people. Um, but that employer was in no hurry and they were backlogged and they were busy and they didn't want to help anybody. It would have been so much easier if I could have just gone, here's my QR code. Here you go. Large centralized systems containing millions of PII accounts. Oh boy, is that appealing to hackers and they're working at it and they're getting really good at this. When you can take out the Office of Personal Management and the government and you can take out a bunch of other things that go along with that, like your security clearances, that's gold. That is absolute mintable gold. So. Person identifiable information is the most targeted data for breaches, comprising 97% of all breaches in 2018. Now, yeah, that social security number, that first name, last name, that combination, um, yeah, that's gold. That is also gold. There's hundreds of thousands of billions of records out there in the dark web with just that. It's all just PII, and you can assume an identity, and then the poor person that gets involved in that, again, just like me, a lifetime of... of fraud and credit monitoring so despite regulatory regu legislation we've got all these laws and rules that say you shouldn't do a thing or here's the penalty the computer cfaa computer fraud and abuse act wow 2.8 billion customer data records were exposed so a good quarter of the planet's records were exposed just in one year was that a crazy amount of money 
to to fix 654 billion and that's in 2018 and i know it's been worse i just want to make this case in point i have been in 58 data breaches including seven exposed passwords not because of anything i've done but because other companies could not take care of my things could not take care of my data did not take care of my data they failed once so what's interesting is that in those 58 data breaches one of them is actually literally the office of personnel management for the u.s government and because of that they have my entire everything they have my security clearance they have my username they have my password they have everything about me they have the file my my file that i filled out for my questionnaire for my security clearance they have an amazing boatload of information on me um, and again, that's why I have credit monitoring for the rest of my natural life. Um, I know that all this stuff is out there and it makes for a really interesting day when it comes to this. And that brings us to fraudulent identities. So the user's digital identity landscape is because of the fragmentation, it's really hard to keep track of all this stuff. Uh, I mean, like really hard. Um, there's a couple of uh, people with my name here in the local area. One of them has diabetes. And you go to, to the doctor and they bring up the wrong person. Um, they want to know how my diabetes is going. I'm, I don't have diabetes. I'm not the one with diabetes. And it was a really bad, bad moment there for, um, because they're like all like, well, who are you? What do you mean? And they thought I was somebody else. How horrible would that have been in an emergency room if I'd been in a car wreck and they pulled up the wrong, wrong person? that person who had some something else like a diabetes or some other diagnosis or some other long-term um, thing that I don't have. So fraudulent identities can be mistaken identities, can be stolen identities, can be fake identities um, that can be used to circumnavigate things, right? Fake identities are fertile ground for counterfeit interactions, right? Are you really selling to that person? So in society, this vulnerability facilitates the creation and dissemination of evils like fake news, right? So Facebook, um, God bless him, <laughs> has a huge problem with, with fake news. And so does Google. And so does a lot of the other modern systems now. And because we can't and will not probably ever be able to point back to and say this is a person, we can create fake news that covers a lot of different things and we can really try to manipulate and do a lot of propaganda because of that so fraudulent identities can really lead to some huge social evils along the way right um just really really bad things so this creation then of your digital identity right uses uh, sends up someone to do what's called a self-sovereign identity so you get your public keys you get your private keys and then the additional data associated with your a digital ID, such as an attestation, which is a very legal word, um, in that you are actually attesting that I am this person and this is who I am and this is how it goes. Um, that's it. The full data itself should not be stored on chain to maintain scalability, but I should be able to point back to a QR code. And you can actually see something like that with the American passport right now. Embedded in the passport is an RFID chip that actually points back to a link. And that's all that's in the RFID chip is a link that points back to a database um, in the passport control um, building. And that brings up all the information that they have on me. That's my, they have my birth certificate. They have all the places I've ever traveled. So there's a lot of information inside that passport RFID chip, which is interesting that you can do all this. And that's what that attestation is all about. And if you could just do it as a QR code or something else on your cell phone, wow, that would make life a little bit easier. So once you've verified your credentials and you attest to a specific characteristics, ID, location, age, diplomas, pay slips, and these can be updated as you move around the world or you move around jobs, right? These credentials are then cryptographically signed by the issuers. And again, they have your identity number or you are allowed to accept these or not do these. You can use this everywhere. We don't have a single profile provider anymore, Google, Facebook, um, or anyone else that we're using, Microsoft. Um, so that can be really kind of interesting what makes this even more interesting and this is the part that gets kind of scary is that we can actually start tying that to your browsing history your social media posts and that is going to make everyone in the privacy market freak big time because once you have a universal id there are a lot of things that go out the door and there is a possibility of misuse. There is a huge possibility of misuse. And the more that I can tie things back to a specific person and the less privacy there is, uh, that can be a problem. If you're 14 and pregnant and looking for a way out of it, um, 
we'll, do we are we going to create a reporting mechanism for that based on your browsing history? It's a valid question. We don't know yet. We haven't gotten there. So the end product is your self-sovereign identity. It's a concept that people and businesses can store their own identity on their own devices. So for most of us, that's going to be our cell phone. You may have a USB stick with a backup on it. And again, there's lots of ways of making sure the data doesn't get completely lost. Um, you can then turn around and use which pieces of data to share to validators without relying on a central repository. Your identity is out there somewhere in the blockchain. And then you could be, um, you know, basically independent of, of, of everybody. This should be turning on the, the, the sovereign identity people should be having a blast with this. The problem is <laughs> there's the potential for misuse. All right, so there are some things that we can actually do with this, and there are things that work really, really well. Secure and seamless travel, right? Again, my passport, I have to show my passport, I have to show my driver's license, I have to show my plane ticket, um, I have to show that I got my shots or whatever else I need to do. I need to show a negative COVID test because we're in that era right now. Again, secure and seamless travel. If it was all just there, boom, I could just show them a QR code and it had everything because I took care of it, boom, done. Um, background checks, again, I feel sorry for anyone that's trying to do a background check on me because I light up like a Christmas tree. And it'd just be really easy if I could just go, boom, here you go, here's my QR code, and they can just, here's all my verifiable stuff, and you're not trying to pick out between me and my father or anyone else with my name. And that was a real issue um, there for a while, was um, my father had, had, and myself, our identities had gotten mixed up officially. So when they ran the background check on me, they would get my dad which is interesting because it was really making it look like my dad had stolen my identity and was busy using it um, all the way back when I was a kid. There's actually a credit card from JC Penney, God, if they're even still around, um, that my dad opened up and they assigned it to me, not to my dad. So interesting, right? Was my dad using my identity? Don't know. But I showed up my background check and that was even more interesting. Healthcare records, right? Again, for me, I have actual proof that people get me confused. There are three different people with my name in the Seattle area. And we get confused. People get us confused a lot. I mean, a lot. I mean, like really a lot. As in like you go into to Multicare, you go into a, and you go into there just because you've got a cold or something. And then they try to ask you about your diabetes or they ask you about something else that's going on and you're the wrong Dan Morrow for that. Streamline, know your customers. So this is also interesting with customer consent. You can actually try to get a little bit of a profile on them, maybe something about uh, advertising, um, you know, something like that along the way. But again, um, there's going to be there's already a lot of data about you and what you do on the Internet and everything else that's not that is attestable to you. There are really interesting mechanisms inside your browser, inside your um, computer system that really, really, really do attest to you being you. So know your customer interesting. Um, we could actually get better client customer success, right? Proof of ownership or insurance. Again, property ownership, for instance, can be used to get insurance for taxes and other things. I can show I own the car. So if the cop comes up because I've been speeding again, um, there you go. Here, yeah, it's really my car. Show me car proof of uh, identity and insurance. Here, just take the QR code. Um, actually, and on that case, you don't want to hand them your phone with the QR code. You want to have a piece of paper with a QR code. Never let the police have your, your devices. So there's all those kinds of things that go into this. So again, there are issues, right? So places, right? And these are all the places that we have our identity. And these are all the things that are actually can be tied together with a single digital identity. My education records, my government records, military service, healthcare, passport, and payment systems. What makes this all the more interesting is if you take a look at and you've gone through some of the other um, use cases here in this in this lecture you'll see that education is really hot on this one and doing the same thing so your education and your digital id can actually go place and hand in hand with each other all right so and there are a number of really good problems that this solves one that single point of failure right if you get the office of personnel management and you, you stole all those identities and all that info really cool information um, it's no longer that big a deal because i have that digital identity i can prove i'm me I can prove I'm who, and that will really help out. Um, and you really do start getting a lot of really interesting things when you have that single point of failure. If you've ever tried to go, um, you know, do a thing, it becomes a problem. If if Facebook's down, so everybody freaks out, right? The other thing that's interesting too is that sometimes if something gets shut down, you know, so like when we had Zune and Microsoft shut down all that digital for the music that you bought, 
wouldn't it be cool if you could have still had access to it because you could prove that you actually owned it right so then every single user has to go through a cost of recovery process or something else or they just walk away from the money that they invested so all modern web applications are basically hosted on third-party servers and don't belong to the application provider right now so again if you have that digital identity and you can go through different ways of doing it right facebook we all use Facebook identity or we use Google identity to sign into hundreds of websites every day. Yeah, there you go. Make sure that you've got it. Then there's some ownership and control issues, right? It goes without saying that full ownership of the profile is crucial to the user, but we don't have that. We are a product. When it looks at um, Facebook or we look at what we actually have for data in Google, if you've ever pulled down your data report, it's really kind of interesting what's in there, what is in there that's important, what's in there that's missing. Um, it's really kind of hacky right now, right? Your, your digital identity as terms of your fa Facebook profile, but you don't own it. You add data to it daily. You journal literally your entire life on it, but you don't own the data. That data is actually owned by Facebook and they can do whatever they want to do with it. So if you have a digital ID that allows you a little bit more control over what you do, um, that will work. The other thing, too, is duplication. You know, if you've ever gone out and you've surfed webs, the first thing that pops up are these big, huge, ugly login, login, login. Use your Google or your Facebook or your Apple ID and all the rest of it to log into the website. And they do that so they can get information. Right. Many systems require users to create accounts. All right. And that's just to even just access their services. And that's cool. Right. We expect that if we were if we're there um, at Toyota. Um, yeah, I have my Toyota ID. I, I certainly signed in with with Google. I didn't worry about it. So the data is still available and it doesn't matter where you log in. This creates um, some backup concerns because if one server gets compromised or goes offline, the data is no longer valid or accessible and systems do go offline. The digital ID, at least along the peer network with hundreds of nodes, really does help out here. Um, some time stamping issues. Time stamps become really, really, really important in a lot of ways, especially if they prove you were where you were or you were doing what you were doing at the time, especially in the legal system. Time stamps are critical. Right. If you are paying for a traffic ticket, if you are working on a, a file or a folder or something else and your boss is like saying, hey, I didn't do it. No, no, here's my timestamp. Boom. And you can prove that you were doing what you needed to do when you needed to do it. The other thing that's interesting, too, and I love this one is Sybil resistance. Right. So a Sybil attack. And I love this one is a type of attack where an attacker subverts this service's reputation right by creating a large number of pseudonymous identities all right and uses them to gain a uh, disproportionately large influence across the network so the digital id as we're currently looking at it really um, helps um, solve that problem so it would prevent mindless spamming across social networks but it also takes things away we have that idea of of in america especially we have that idea that we have the ability to to say anything we want to say and not and learning about consequences from that so it's interesting but it would really 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 have an effect on the propaganda and we have a really bad propaganda problem right now um, in with the internet and with facebook it is a huge propaganda problem so adding those verifiable credentials right if you are in control of your own identity um, empowers them to have their reputation precede them across systems and networks that's actually really cool Right. If you can then tie this to your educational attainment, if you can tie this to your Udemy account, if you can tie this to any of those other things that we do. Right. That proof of identity method with the cryptographic signatures. Um, boom. It's the same thing as a fingerprint scan or a voice sample. We've got it. That verifiable credential um, will allow a user to select an endorsement key that builds up that reputation for each system. You no longer need to maintain multiple profiles. You just have the one profile that one digital ID and boom, you are in the market. So how this can be used, you know, blockchain is capable of addressing the issues posed by identity management. Um, we can provide identity synchronization worldwide, eliminating redundancy. So everything gets collected. We just basically roll up everything that I've ever done into this. Um, eliminating identity sibling, again, that attack where I make a bunch of fake IDs and use those to influence the network. It doesn't mean I can't make a bunch of fake IDs, right? Because I will if I can. Um, and use those for other things, but it makes it harder to influence the network because of the sheer um, entropy of the network, right? Providing proof of existence. And that's a really interesting concept. Can you really prove that you exist within the system? And not having that identity makes it really hard to prove that you exist. 
It really does. Uh, we have tied identity to centralized government systems for so long that it's become the only way that you can prove that you are really you and that you really exist and you are really worth um, services. Right? And then providing individual control to users. As long as the user maintains control over their device, they're in pretty good shape. So the Sybil attack, I actually really like this one. Right? So which damn moral am I? <laughs> right? I mean, you just go and you type in anyone. I, the, the good part is I know most of these damn morals. We've all gotten together and said, oh my goodness. So um, which one are we? And that's where this makes it kind of interesting, right? And the idea of that Sybil attack is that all these people are all individually valid people right we're all really doing our own thing we're having fun with it we're doing our stuff um, we all live in different places um, we all have other things that go along the way so how do you two how do you prove who is who and that's where the digital id can kind of come in because each one of us even though we share the same name had different steps through life we all went to different places we all did different stuff we all worked on different things interestingly enough though this is a, an attack surface. So issues with loss, and this is a big one, right? And you don't want to lose your stuff. You don't ever want to lose your stuff. But at some point, right, we all lose a thing. We lose our phone. Phone gets broken or destroyed. Uh, we lose our USB stick. I mean, again, we, we lose things. So loss of trusted device or your private key pair, that kills it right then and there. There's very little, if no, recovery model mode if the private key is forgotten. So if you forget your 12 character or your 12 phrase um, recovery, uh, yeah, you're not, you're, you're dead. You're dead in the water. You start all over again, or you try to figure out how you're going to do this. There is an attack surface, and that's what makes it interesting. But we're not sure how costly it would be to set up all those multiple identities enough to influence the network. And that's the same reason why they do what they do in Bitcoin, right? It really makes it harder to do that 51% attack. But that attack surface is really going to be hard to do, but it's there. So we want to be really aware of not just fraud, but fraudulent identities that are posing as um, acceptable identities. We've got the Sybil attack. We've got the which damn moral is which, right? And then there's formatting. Um, we all have different formats for our names and naming conventions and processes. We would need an international organization or again, Microsoft, which is hugely involved in this. And a lot of, a lot of big colleges international are involved in this kind of thing to really figure out what the contents of the block are gonna look like. What does the block format look like? How do we work with our formal name, our nicknames, other naming conventions, you know, Bob, Bobby, Bob, Robert, you know, we're all that same person uh, with just different ages, different various ages, and then forged identities. So we'll still have the ability to forge identity, so it's not going to solve all problems. It actually creates some new ones, especially the loss of trusted device or private key. Because it is a central globalized um, identity, um, it's a little bit more interesting than losing your driver's license. Right? Your driver's license, you can go get a new one fairly, fairly rapidly, it's just going to cost you some money. But losing your device, if someone has access to your device or they've got your PIN or anything else and passcodes to get into your digital identity, they can become you relatively easily. And no one knows who's behind the device. And that's the other big one, right? It would be take a picture every time someone does that to make sure that there's some kind of biometric or something else involved here. All right. So I'm thankful that you sat through this because this is a really interesting technology. And I know this lecture is really super long, but this is a really hot technology right now. Right. This is one where they are actively working on it. There are neat things going on in this. Uh, and there's already identity frameworks. It's already written into support systems like Microsoft Active Directory. So there's ways of doing this. There are already identity networks existing in Ethereum with companies like MetaMask using it as a, an identity system as well. You know, we need a great way to protect our IDs, but rather than relying on corporations, we are in control of our ID. We just have to make sure we have an offline wallet or ways of recovery that go beyond human weirdness because humans will do crazy things with what we've got. And again, it doesn't solve all problems. There are still going to be issues with loss, forgery, theft, um, improper identity, and proper credentialing, stolen things, but it does solve that one problem of 1.1 billion people that simply do not have access to an identity. They cannot prove that they exist. They cannot prove that they exist enough that they can get government or international aid or services or anything else. And as long as you have a cell phone or something that you can use to attest your identity, 
um, you're pretty much so good to go. Carry it around like you carry around your wallet or your purse every day. We're pretty good about not forgetting our wallet. We're pretty good about not forgetting our purse. So while we're not solving all problems, we are solving one really big human problem, and that is who are you? What is your identity? And if you can prove that you exist, all of a sudden a lot of services and a lot of other items become available to you. So thanks for sitting through this lecture on digital identity. This is a fascinating technology as part of blockchain. And, and it's really, again, a hot technology. If you're working in this field, you know, thank you for doing that. This is, again, a neat thing. And I think it's going to have some really interesting ramifications as we go through. All right. Thank you. I will see you in the next lecture.